How's it going everyone? Welcome to yet another video in our little FSG Summer Bash. And for this week we have the next member of Hoenn's vaunted weather trio, the mighty Groudon, shaper of continents. Groudon has obviously had a massive presence amongst fans ever since it adorned the box art of Pokemon Ruby and played a potentially apocalyptic role in that game's story. With of course Team Magma trying to get a hold of Groudon so that they could expand the landmass of the world. But then inadvertently bringing a drought around the world and making the sun way too harsh and of course it's up to you a 10 year old kid to save the world from a giant legendary by either catching it or KOing it by finally confronting it in the cave of origin and as a kid I have to say as far as memories goes those were probably some of my fondest memories in the Pokemon game it was also on the box art of Pokemon Coliseum and in the game's introduction using fissure even though it wasn't part of the story but whatever and as for less prominent appearances there was a fake Groudon that appeared in the Jirachi Wishmaker even though on the box art it looks like a real Groudon, but whatever. And also a Robo Groudon in Pokemon XD, although the latter was far less menacing. But anyways, today we'll see if Groudon lived up to its titanic reputation in the competitive scene. And thus we ask, how good was Groudon actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. The clash of Groudon's Drought and Kyogre's Drizzle is probably the most classic, definitive dynamic in the history of the Uber tier. Groudon wasn't just a weather machine though. Its Earthquake is one of the strongest attacks in the game, and even a defensive Kyogre wouldn't want to take the full brunt of one with max attack investment, and that's to say nothing of the occasional Choice Bander. The plethora of steals like Jirachi, Metagross, and Registeel, and squishy special sponges like Blissey, Snorlax, and Regice to deal with the Laddie Twins meant Groudon had plenty of victims to scare. Though, to be fair, the Laddie Twins didn't mind Groudon's Earthquake in the slightest, obviously, and threatened it on its weaker special defense stat. However, that didn't mean they were safe. A Choice Band Hidden Power Ghost would absolutely destroy them on the Switch, but without the initial boost, it couldn't give them such a potentially lethal blow. But if slowed down first, Groudon could also tear them open with a Swords Dance set, and these two just so happened to be the best counters to Kyogre, who learned Thunder Wave. Thus, the pair teamed up for a synergistic onslaught with terrifying powerful attacks. Groudon can even use Thunder Wave itself, eschewing hidden power, on a set well known as the Paradancer. This was also highly useful against its best counter, Lugia. For faster paced teams that didn't want to waste time spreading paralysis, Groudon could fix its low speed by running Substitute and Select Berry to run over opposing offense. Substitute was also a real nail in the coffin for a desperate Blissey trying to land a Toxic. And as for Groudon's Sun, it usually didn't abuse it itself, although it certainly was capable of overheating cocky Skarmory. However, the Sun obviously provided its teammates with great benefits, such as strengthening moves like Mewtwo's Fire Blast and Latios's Hidden Power Fire, or in some cases, just making sure Rain wasn't up, which was usually enough. Making the opposing Laddie Twins' Thunder only 50% accurate was also incredibly useful, especially since Groudon could use its electric immunity to safely pivot in. In Sun, Latios could even use Solar Beam to safely obliterate opposing Groudon, especially since Kyogre wouldn't dream of switching in. Chlorophyll Exeggutor also had some decent utility with sleep and explosion. Conversely, standing in the way of Swift Swim Amistar or Ludicolo was also incredible. Finally, Groudon's immense bulk usually meant it could take one hit, and in such a kill-heavy metagame, being able to survive one choice band assault from Rayquaza, Deoxys Attack, or opposing Groudon was often the difference between a win and a loss. Overall, unsurprisingly, Groudon was one of the best Pokemon in the Ubers tier. Groudon loved the introduction of Stealth Rock, being a great user of the move while being resistant to it and having all its checks be hit neutrally by it, with the exception of Lugia, who was weak to it. Stealth Rock was important to help combat the power creep threats of the fourth generation, especially Kyogre, whose water spouts backed by the new choice specs were shaping the landscape of the metagame. 12% may not seem like a lot, but it adds up, and Pokemon is a game of inches, and battles have been won off of much, much less. Sun weakening water moves was more useful now because of Palkia and its Hydro Pumps and Aqua Tails, as well as Kingdra and Kabutops joining the ranks of terrifying Swift Swimmers, and of course warding off Thunder, which had even more users now. This in addition to fending off threats such as Garchomp and Dialga, if only by the skin of its teeth, again, Game of Inches, made up most of Groudon's defensive utility. It was an integral part of nearly every successful stall team as a result. Offensively, it became a whole new behemoth with the additions of Life Orb for power without choice restriction, Rock Polish to Jet Pass 
Pass Offense, and Physical Dragon Claw for the Laddie Twins, as well as Giratina Origin upon Platinum's release. Both were prime members of the metagame and many teams' go-to Groudon check, so this coverage was hugely important. Groudon was a prime candidate for a wall breaker or cleaner on heavy physical offense teams, either breaking open holes for Lucario and Rayquaza or taking advantage of the holes broken by them. The old Paradancer was also terrific, as paralyzing Lugia or the Laddie Twins was even better than before, and it would also cripple Giratina Origin form, while providing team support for slower wall breakers, such as Choice Specs Dialga or Kyogre. Groudon could also run a double setup set, choosing which boost to use according to the situation, and its bulk was so massive, it could sometimes get both boosts, in which case, good luck. Heart Gold and Soul Silver gave Ho-Oh Brave Bird and turned it into a huge threat, but it needed Groudon Sun support for its Sacred Fires. It was easier to maintain Sun when the opposing team's best Sacred Fire switch, Kyogre, also got melted by Brave Bird, which created lots of dangerous scenarios for the opponent. Ho-Oh also happened to give setup Groudon with one coverage move more of a reason to run Stone Edge over Dragon Claw, but it generally already wanted to do that, for fear of being stonewalled by Lugia, unless the player also had a Lugia lure like Mix Request and preferred to cleave through the Laddie Twins and Giratina Origin form with Groudon itself, which was a completely viable strategy. Lumberry also became more popular on Groudon as a result, although that of course had other uses like Giratina Alters Will-O-Wisp and Dark Rise Dark Void. And speaking of status, not long after the dawn of Ho-Oh, the metagame gave birth to Defensive Heatran, another Groudon-dependent monster that preyed on the plethora of steals that warded off dragons while warding off dragons itself and racking up status and hazard damage on everything. Finally, this is where Groudon gained Lava Plume. Now, it could always run a fire move to ward off Fortress before, since games between and against defensive teams really exemplified the previous idea of a game of inches, and having the Stealth Rocker so readily scare Fortress was a good thing, but it came with the drawback of being useless against every one of Groudon's switch-ins. With Lava Plume, it could readily spread burn, which was amazing against every one of Groudon's switch-ins, especially Giratina Origin. Finally, it's worth mentioning that Groudon was heavily involved in the great base 90 speed Creep War, duking it out alongside other Uber Titans like Kyogre, Dialga, Giratina Origin, and Ho-Oh. Overall, Groudon was an incredible Pokemon that was key in the success of both offensive, balance, and defensive teams alike. In 2010, when four restricted Pokemon were allowed on a team, but you could only bring two to one match, Groudon of course ruled the roost itself, and of course it had its weather clashing as always with Kyogre. Getting the initial weather boost was so important that players sometimes ran even Iron Ball, so its sun would prevail if they both let off. And of course, weather fueled many teams, from fire moves to chlorophyll to Cresselia's moonlight. Its EVs were focused in power and speed, with Rock Slide for a strong spread move, possibly boosted by Swords Dance. And with that, it unsurprisingly dominated worlds, appearing on the 7th, 6th, 5th, 4th, 3rd, and 1st place teams from Alan Chambers, Takushi Morishima, Huey Ha, Wataru Onishi, Isao Yoshioka, and Ray Rizzo respectively, with its 6 out of 8 usage beating out Kyogre's 5 out of 8 and netting Groudon the title of most popular Pokemon. And if Worlds is a good indicator of the metagame coming before it, there's records of plenty of Groudons in the regional tournaments before Worlds, and if we sat here to name all of them, we would be here forever. Also, you're gonna hear me say that later, trust me. Anyways, Groudon and VGC 2010 was undeniably top tier. Groudon remained rock steady in the ever-changing landscape of BW. New spinners came to light in Excadrill and Raindish Tentacruel. The former was also a terrifying Sandsweeper, and Groudon was key to cutting off their weather-related shenanigans. Of course, Groudon had to watch out for toxic spikes from the latter. The metagame became more hazard-focused. The release of Arceus put a halt on big offense guns and also provided a great new spin blocker, and Ferrothorn was basically the best thing ever. Aside from Choice Specs Water Spout, it was a Kyogre counter that also ate up dragon moves with ease, and spam spikes and leech seed, which was especially devastating with protect. Groudon loved these qualities, and the duel made for an amazing 1-2 hazard lane threat checking punch, especially since Groudon now had Dragon Tail, to phase in the face of taunt and dish out some damage while doing it, making the accumulated damage sting even more. These two helped fend off the terrifying new Zekrom, with Groudon even blocking the momentum grabbing Volt Switch, although they had to be careful, as this duel's prominence gave rise to the Life Orb variant with Draco Meteor 
Meteor and Focus Blast. Gliscor became popular mostly thanks to its ability to shut this duel down with Taunt while spreading Toxic easily, since it walled Groudon, didn't mind spikes, and had consistent recovery with Poison Heal. On a more positive note, Blaziken, Reshiram, and Victini were absolutely nuclear threats under Groudon's Sun. And while through most of the generation, Groudon went defensive for longevity to win the Weather War, in Black and White 2, it started using a faster Stealth Rock set with Earth Plate to destroy Specs Dialga that had been sniping the defensive variants, and this led to a more offensive metagame overall, which fit in with the introduction of the fast-paced Genesect and the new nuke, Kirim White, both prime partners. And while multi-scale Lugia really put the nail in the coffin for Groudon's sweeping days, Regenerator Ho-Oh was a terror for everything and really necessitated Stone Edge on these sets. Finally, Lava Plume fit beautifully on this set to keep offensive pressure on Ferrothorn, Fortress, Skarmory, Kyogre, Giratina Origin, the Laddie Twins, and Arceus forms, making for a fearsome, well-rounded Stealth Rock setter that helped keep the pace up and shape the more offensive Black and White 2 metagame. Weather was no longer permanent in XY, but Groudon was tremendous all the same, with its usual blend of offensive-defensive duties, staving off Pokemon like Dialga, Zekrom, and Mega Kangaskhan. It now had to contend with Arceus forms having Defog, which was annoying, but manageable with Toxic and especially with Mega Gengar lurking in the shadows. However, upon the release of Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, Groudon received something even better than Mega Evolution. After Mega Rayquaza's ban, Primal Groudon came to the forefront of the metagame and established itself as the uncontested best Pokemon, boasting ludicrous usage and receiving claims such as being required for a competitive viable team by most players. Its new part fire typing gave it a fairy resistance, thus providing the Xerneas check the tier desperately needed, became resistant to Ho-Oh's sacred fire and immune to its burn, and suddenly it was the one that had the upper hand on Kyogre, switching in and evaporating any water moves. Of course, if Kyogre switched into it, it had to run away, but Primal Kyogre's defense stat did not enjoy the new Precipice Blades, even more than its previous iterations had not enjoyed Earthquake. Kyogre did sometimes run physical sets with Earthquake itself, though, as its mighty new attack let it lure in and smack Groudon on its new ground weakness. Anyway, speaking of Precipice Blades, Groudon gained this stronger alternative to Earthquake, which, while bemoaned for its accuracy, made even Arceus quake in its boots, especially since Primal Groudon's already colossal attack had jumped to absolutely staggering levels. After a Source Dance, its attack stat is over a thousand. It fit in on every kind of team, from stall to balance to offense, and had a significant effect on every battle it was in. Losing leftovers and gaining a Stealth Rock neutrality was admittingly a pain, but Groudon more than managed. It tended to use either a defensive Stealth Rock set on more balanced teams for maximum defensive utility against Xerneas, Ho-Oh, Mega Salamence, and Primal Groudon, an offensive Stealth Rock set possibly with Sword Dance on more offensive teams to muscle through the opposition rather than wearing it down, or a setup sweeper variant that fit beautifully on Hyper offense teams, being one of the chain of sweepers the opponent so often just could not handle. Groudon did it all, and was essential on just about every team in the metagame. It was the absolute face of Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. When the restricted Pokemon were announced for 2016, Primal Groudon was of course one of the most hyped Pokemon. Its newfound water immunity with desolate lands, fire stab and resistance, and ground weakness are key aspects of the format that would be used and abused the entire year. Its presence in the metagame was so enormous that some people even used Golduck just for its ability Cloud9 to deal with Primal Groudon. As always, it would clash with Primal Kyogre, but this time Mega Rayquaza joined the fray as it's legal in VGC. These three alongside Xerneas, which Groudon was key in helping stave off, made up the big four, the strongest of the restricted Pokemon. Groudon often paired with one of the other three, especially Xerneas, to make for monstrously powerful cores. And thus, the Xernodon core was special because Xerneas and Groudon destroyed each other's checks. Xerneas crushed Veltal and Mega Salamence, while Groudon pummeled Steels. And as for entire teams, Groudon itself was part of the big six, which was six Pokemon that basically worked so well with each other, which consisted of itself, Xerneas, Mega Salamence, Mega Kangaskhan, Smeargle, and Talonflame. This team helped define the standard of power in the metagame, was hugely popular, and brought much success to many users. And I'm sure this team gave competitors flashbacks of the Chalk team, which was only a season ago. However, of course, that wasn't the only teams. There were definitely a lot more, like Dual Primals, which was a similarly popular archetype that packed unmatched immediate power and matchup flexibility. While Groudon had some minor flaws, like not being slow enough 
enough to underspeed Pokemon like Amoongus and Mawile in Trick Room. By and large, it was just about perfect. And speaking of Trick Room, Trick Room was often set by Bronzong and Cresselia, which provided excellent support with the move, as well as helping the anti Xerneas effort. Groudon often chose between Rock Slide and Rock Tomb as anti flying coverage. The former was a spread move, but Rock Tomb got around Wide Guard and provided speed control, which gave Team support and helped Groudon overcome its own average speed. Groudon's power and support still had enormous gravity, and of course, nothing like switching into a Precipice Blades. In fact, one of its most powerful stab moves in Precipice Blades hit both Pokemon and the opposing team, and this made the metagame extra volatile as hitting or missing one could change the whole game. Primal Groudon was just so extremely versatile and powerful. In fact, one could even run special variants of Primal Groudon if they wanted to take out other things like Mega Kangaskhan with Eruption during Harsh Sun, which has a 31.3 chance to one-hit KO, or even opposing Primal Groudon with Earth Power, which has a 37.5 chance to one-hit KO if they have max speed but only four special defense EVs. As such, Primal Groudon's usage was so astronomically off the charts that listing every single placement, even only first places from regionals, would be ridiculous and would keep us here forever, so we've only limited it to top eight of worlds. But if you want to see the really long list of the Primal Groudons we found, you can check that out in the description down below. So anyways, and I apologize in advance for Gen 6 and Gen 7 if I butcher any of your names. At World's Top 8, Primal Groudon was on the teams that claimed 5th, 4th, and 2nd spots with Aaron Trailer, Eduardo Kana, and Jonathan Evans respectively. And as you can see, the overwhelming majority of 2016 players had Groudon on their team. And of course, just like we mentioned in the Rayquaza video, Zoranodon was such a big problem that the other 4 players in Top 8 used the Ray Ogre core just to fight off that opposing core. And you can learn more about that in the Rayquaza Quasar video that we did like two months ago. Anyways, Groudon had enormous usage and that was for a reason. It won a lot. It utterly dominated the metagame. Groudon played mostly the same role in the 7th generation, although it started making use on previously unseen techniques in addition to its usual bag of tricks. Eruption variants, also nicknamed Chinese Groudon for the players from whom it originated, were absolutely nuclear and scorched Arceus Ground and Celesteela. Fire Blast was a more reliable stab move and many rock polished variants utilized it alongside Hidden Power Ice, which was amazing because it cut right through the new Zygarde Complete, while providing a safer option against Mega Salamence. Dragon Pulse provided a similar option that would also hit Giratina Origin hard. And speaking of Mega Ments, the Aerial Light nerf meant Groudon could tank it more easily this time around. However, this coverage wasn't perfect, as Regenerator Ho-Oh gaining the fog in Ultra Sun and Moon meant one had to be careful when running the Salamence set on an offensive team should the Stealth Rocker setter have sacrificed itself. Otherwise, Ho Oh will just remove a major source of pressure on the opponent's team. The introduction of Necrozma Duskmane, Ultra Necrozma, and Mars Shadow was also key, as Duskmane relieved some pressure on Groudon to handle Xerneas, and all three provided another potent threat for offensive teams to pile on the opponent, being able to double down on bulky Arceus forms. Groudon's defensive set was also a decent check to opposing Duskmane, although it ironically would boost the defense variance's Morning Sun recovery. Overall, Groudon was once again the face of the tier, a huge part of any kind of team, and a game in game out monster. In the 2019 Sun and Moon series, Groudon could not hold Red Orb, so it had to operate in its base form. The Sun series in particular also did not have Z-moves, so Groudon was not yet able to abuse them, but it also did not yet have to contend with them, or Mega Forms for that matter. Despite losing its Fairy and Fire resistances and Water immunity, it was still excellent, and of course appreciated not being weak to ground. It still made for a fearsome pairing with Xerneas, interfering with Kyogre's water attacks, and greatly threatening steals that would trouble Xerneas such as Solgaleo, Duskmane, Necrozma, Ferrothorn, and Stakataka. Threatening Incineroar that would try to mess with Xerneas with a combination of Fake Out and Snarl definitely helped as well. Ipapa Berry was a huge boon, helping fix Groudon's low speed and lack of recovery while letting it keep on trucking. It commonly supported Venusaur, an excellent chlorophyll sweeper, and general weapon thanks to its ability to threaten both Kyogre and Xerneas, as well as the Tapus and other Groudon. Then in the Moon series, it gained access to Z-moves, which allowed it to jack up Precipice Blades' his power, not hit its partner, bypass wide guard, go through protect, and perhaps most importantly, not miss. However, it also had to watch out for other fearsome Z moves, such as Lunala's menacing Moonray's Maelstrom. I say that three times fast. It ran either a fast Groundium Z set, a Trick Room variant with Groundium Z, or a specially defensive set with a pinch HP berry. And Groudon is so powerful once again that we've limited to only first place finishes. And they are as follows. In the Sun series, Juan Nar reached first at the Santiago 
special event where Gav Malavia reached first at the Anaheim Regionals and Harold Cole reached first at the Tampines Regionals. In the Moon Series, Alberto Rios reached first at the Panama Special Event, Nick Navari reached first at Dallas, Juan C. Ortiz reached first at the Ecuador Special Event, Jake Major at the Collinsville Regionals, Forrest Aurelian reached first at the Cannes Special Event, Alberto Rios reached first at the Cuidad Panama Regionals, Juan Silk Jung reached first in the Korean League second season, and finally Alessio Yuri Bachetto reached first at the Bozano Special Event. And as for the upcoming Ultra Series, Primal Groudon will finally be allowed and be fully unleashed, likely with a set consisting of Protect, Swords Dance, and its stabs, with heavy emphasis on bulk, and its dominance is fully expected, though I'm also down to be surprised. And that's it! So how good was Groudon actually? Well, it definitely lived up to the superlatives one might attach to such a monolithic Pokemon. Ever since its introduction, it's been one of the defining faces of the Uber tier, and its in-game clash with Kyogre was representative of, without question, the most definitive Uber's clash of all time. It's been an absolutely phenomenal Pokemon and a critical metagame presence in every generation, and every single VGC year it's been allowed in too. And ever since becoming Primal, it's ascended even further, both in singles and VGC. Overall, Groudon was amazing, and then some, and lives up to every hyperbole. Thanks for watching everyone, and as always, if you liked the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content, and since we have videos lined up for this month of June, I have the feeling you can guess who's coming next. So I want to know in the comments, what do you think about competitive Groudon? Is it too damn powerful? Whatever it is, let me know. And of course, thank you so much to the patrons for continued support of our videos, and thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.